Well, hello, Fred. Michael. <laughs> it's honored to be on your show. Oh, man. No, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be about anywhere at this point. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit. We mentioned the theme that you're using in your background, which is perfect for the, for the show, um, <laughs> the, the, the Wild Woods and Water show. Um, talk a little bit about why you're here and the organization that you're representing. Sure. Wisconsin's Green Fire is a organization really dedicated to the role of science in conservation. Right? Our, our mission is really to carry the light of science and research and evidence and uh, the art of conserving natural resources. And Green Fire members live all over the state. We include a, a large number of conservation professionals ranging from air quality experts and water quality experts to some of the states uh, and, and the region's best biologists and wildlife ecology and uh, forestry and, and points in between. And what we're really trying to do is maintain and strengthen the long-standing Wisconsin tradition of, of being a leader in conservation and thoughtful, sustaining and preserving our natural resources for all of our benefits. It's a great organization to, to run and really an honor to work with all the folks involved in it. I think the word that jumped out to me in, all, in everything you just said and that piques my interest is the word thoughtful. Um, it, it's a struggle sometimes to be thoughtful <laughs> in, in this day and age. Just speak to me a little bit about what you mean by that word and the importance of that word. Well, you know, I, I, first of all, the decisions around how we care for water or land or forests uh, or our fisheries are, are never easy. There are, are interests and benefits and stakeholders and to some extent winners and losers, sometimes winners all around if we make the right decisions. But, but in order to get there, we, we have to understand both the environmental aspects of, of decisions as well as the social and economic aspects. How does this stuff affect people? Um, how can we sustain the, the bounty of the incredible resources and land and water that we have in this state so that next generations can benefit? So I think the thoughtful approach requires thinking beyond our own immediate needs um, or our own personal interests to, to how we can make decisions that are really best for all. And that's, that's the public trust that, uh, that both the state is committed to do by statute and by our constitution. And that I think is a matter of moral obligation, uh, we all ought to try to do. I'm thinking about what you said about that thoughtful relationship. And even that um, the stakeholders comment is really important. I come from loggers, but I also yeah. come from people who, uh, you know, my father who logged the same patch of land for 40 years. So in other, it's pretty yeah. clear he didn't just cut them all. Um, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And and the other part of the, so, so part of me is, uh, I like it when someone recognizes that there's, there's more than one dimension to this, to this particular discussion. And then the other thing I just wonder about when we see the changes in hunting, the changes in the demographics, um, that there's a certain, some of us that came up with a certain body of environmental knowledge, whether we knew it or not, yeah. how that has changed, maybe, Again, I'll stop talking and just let you kind of weave those observations into your 30 year, 30 year career. Sure. Well, so in my own work, I, I think the mission that I've kind of been called to, um, maybe that only becomes apparent when you look back on life, uh, but has been to work in the woods and to try to try to bring together the the sort of vision for um, forests that, that benefit everybody. So I've, I've worked as a logger myself. I've run a logging contracting groups. I've also worked as an ecologist for conservation groups uh, to try to understand the wildlife and the, all the biological richness in our forests. And most of my career, I've been pushing people from both those ends of the spectrum toward the middle to understand that we can have a productive forest resource and 
and we can also uh, protect and enhance the biodiversity and the ecological richness that many people, uh, that we all benefit from. And, and there are examples of other people who have done that work in water and in wildlife and in fisheries. And, and that is really part of the art of conservation. Uh, the concepts that Aldo Leopold helped really pioneer as an international um, thought leader in conservation. Today, I think those traditions can serve us well and they are serving us well as we face new challenges. The, you know, the threats from climate change, we understand are real, they're in front of us, they're urgent. Uh, the, the impacts that we're seeing from contaminated water, both in our cities and in our rural areas from a variety of, uh, of problems, um, those are getting worse. And now in the face of a global pandemic, uh, outdoor spaces actually have a new role or maybe a, a more appreciated role for a safe place for people to recreate and get outdoors. So I, I think the traditions that we've developed in this state and, and, and other places around thoughtful conservation are, are needed now more than ever to help address these new challenges. I think as a way of wrapping up then, um, Talk a little bit about, when I, I love to tell people about the big top. Yeah. And one of the things I always point out is the reason that I can brag that place up is that I was going there as a paying customer long before I ever put foot on the stage. Um, and I just remember my first visit up there and marveling at the, the setting and the view and all of those. Nature is just an essential element of that place. Yeah. And so um, maybe just speak a little bit to your, your experience with it and how it ties into the team. Yeah, you bet. Well, I, I moved to Wisconsin in 1989, and, and I, I'm pretty sure my first visit to the Big Top was 1991, so going on almost 30 years now. Um, and I, I, what I remember most about that program, um, in addition to the, uh, all the familiar characters, was... Uh, Bill Monroe and his Bluegrass Boys were the uh, were the musical show that night, and uh, uh, you know that was still near the end of Bill's career. But uh, I'll always remember that one of his uh, one of his bandmates, at, at a quiet moment, uh, said into the microphone, "Well, it sure is pretty up here, all this water and all." And uh, <laughs> That night just really stuck with me and, and cemented the Big Top as a touch point for Wisconsin in my mind. Well, that's a lovely, that's a perfect moment. I love those small moments like that. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much. And uh, is there anything that you, you want to say uh, going out here about Wisconsin's Green Fire? No, we're, uh, uh, you can find us on the website at uh, www wigreenfire.org. Um, we uh, appreciate the work of the Big Top and, and your work in, in really helping elevate conservation and, and as one of the critical themes in, in our Wisconsin cultural traditions. So uh, glad to be here with you today, Michael, and thanks for all you do. You bet. Same to you. Thanks for everything. See you down the road. Bye-bye. Okay.
What's that, Dad? You want me to fish this run here? Try to get a good float across that riffle by that elm log? All right. You're going to fish downstream and back? Okay, good luck. Watch that man disappear around a bend in this Willow River all the time I was growing up. And everything remains inside. The cool Sunday after church water, the hot glare outside the shadows under the second bridge, the slip of a waiter's shoe, and the crunch of gravel on the narrows between the river and the race. A hundred summers ago, boys walked their cows out from the family little farms and from the village of Hudson to let the cows graze all day while they swam and fished and threw rocks and did all the things children will do when they are given the gift of freedom with responsibility. Now history asks us to look at what lies above the surface. But my dad taught me to imagine what is underneath and on this run here, under that riffle, just this side of that elm log, are brook trout, resting from their ceaseless labor of feeding and staying upright in the flow. The willows always been trout water. When the Lakota and Ojibwa people struggled with each other along these banks, they took trout from the river. And long before them, the mound builders followed the game trails down from the sacred bluffs above the St. Croix to take trout with root nets and spears. The willow begins in tangled brush and mystery, just a little east of Deer Park. And then it moves quietly along through meadows and fields, past cottonwoods and oaks and the secret life of cows. It slips past the old lemonade farm and down into Burkhart where Christian built his first flour mill, passes the ruins of the High Falls Dam and then becomes a, a little lake behind the restored middle dam. It spills over the spillway and it becomes solitude without loneliness. The river divides into two, the, the main and the race the main river passes under the second bridge and the race slips through the first bridge past Fred Nord's farm where the Greens, the first family to settle on the willow, homesteaded. You can still see the silo that Fred worked so hard to put up. He was a happy man. They said that he could work hard all day and then come through the door laughing. Well, the river reunites again just above the swinging bridge and then it uh, slips under the brush dam and then like a lot of us in middle age and when we're approaching the end it begins to spread out and becomes Lake Malalu the pond and then it's on to the last dam at the mouth of the St. Croix there and into that river and that's that short and sweet. From the brush dam to a little ways past the middle dam are trout waters. Very few trout below and almost none above. Trout waters. Mrs. Larson told the story of coming out from her cottage one day to get a pan of water to clean with and when she dipped it into the river and pulled it up a legal sized brook trout lay in it. Now, if you love to fish, especially here on the Willow, you need to thank Frank Wade. Frank was a Civil War soldier and a logger, and he loved to fish the Willow until one day in 1896, some men came over from Minnesota, bought up 200 acres, fenced off the river to create the exclusive Minnesota Club so that only they could fish. Well, this angered a lot of people. But Frank decided to do something about it. On a splendid day in June, 
he rowed up river to fish. He took with him a sandwich and a box of dynamite. Now, he took 10 trout by line, and when he came to a fence or obstruction erected by the club, he blew it up. Frank got his wish, and his case went all the way to the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Now, the Minnesota club lawyer argued some uppity British law about tidal waters and rights of privilege and property, but this was the United States of America and the progressive state of Wisconsin. And the court ruled for Frank. It wrote, no one can own the particles of water that flow in a river just as nobody can own the air that moves above it. And neither are fish property, just as the birds in the air are not. And so the willow was declared forever public and free to fish, to fish. A noun becomes a verb, becomes a noun. Nobody ever goes out into the woods to deer. The great jurist and writer and trout fisherman Robert Trevor wrote, we fish to get out of town, to escape doing the things we hate. It's a small act of rebellion and an endless source of delight. And it's not that fishing is so terribly important, it's just that all the other concerns in life are equally unimportant. And it gives us the golden chance not to think at all. Oh, he's good. Oh, I got un unstuck. What's that, Dad? Oh. Well, I just got unsnared there. Uh, did I catch anything? Well, I made a few good casts. I watched that man reappear around a bend in the river most of my life. The poet Rilke wrote, all fish are mute, one used to think. But who knows? Maybe there's a place where, at last, without them, we may be able to speak in the language of fish. Mm -hmm.